Uh, I'd like to say two things, uh, if I may, before we kind of get into um, the Word of God. It leads into what I would love to share with you this morning. I had the joy, Liz and I, of this week already having been spending time with your, the elders and wives of this church community, which has been such a great joy, and hearing stories of, of ups and downs that have happened in recent times. Um, and the first thing I want to mention is, is that um, I have had the joy and privilege of being connected uh, with this church community since 1984 onwards. Uh, that was only just when the church was really beginning to, um, to start. And uh, also, uh, just the, the sense of feeling that this is a time maybe of reflection, a time of thinking about this church community that has existed for 40 years. It's kind of like a generation. And I think it's not incidental that you get to a place where you then look back and reflect on the journey that we've been on and what we have learnt and what we feel is really important. So the question, what kind of church is Jubilee Community Church? is actually a very important question to answer for past, present, and for future as well. What were the foundations of this church when they were laid all those years ago? What are the values, the DNA, that's been established over many years? Have they changed? Do we believe them anymore? Do we believe other things? Um, and I feel that, the, that God wants to speak to us about the fact that wells, we've had the word already about, you know, flushing toilets and things this morning. We've had a word about, about rivers, you know, beginning to rise up. There are wells in this church for many years. And I think it's important that we recognise what those wells are and that we actually redig those wells if they have at any time become a little bit blocked up. I wonder what those wells are and how do we redig those wells? So I want to invite you to come and be here again on Wednesday evening because we're going to spend some time looking at the wells that have been dug in this church and asking, well, what are they and how do we redig them? How does a new generation? Not only get what those things are, but actually take it to a greater level in the years to come. So I'm excited about that. You don't look like you're very excited. But if you would like to find out more about those things and even get into an environment where we together go on a bit of a journey, then I, I really would love you to come and join. What time is it on Wednesday night? I don't know. 7.30. Okay, so 7.30 Wednesday night. Please be here. We'll have some time together looking at those things. The second thing as we lead into this word I want to share with you this morning is knowing something of our history and your ups and downs and having gone through COVID and some of the leadership challenges this church has gone through and, and some of the, the, you know, the fact that people have come and gone and changes happen. How on earth are you still here? I don't know whether you've ever thought about that, but the miraculous uh, awareness... <laughs> that this church community not only believes some of this stuff, but we're actually here. There have been decades of change. There's been opposition, faced massive political challenges and race challenges and, and leadership challenges. Loads have changed. And then you've gone through a pandemic for two and a half years. How on earth are we still here today and functioning? We shouldn't take that for granted. Is it because this church is full of gifted people? Is that how we're here? Is it because this church is renowned worldwide for its amazing organisational skills? Is that why we're still here? Is it the sound doctrine that we've kind of proclaimed? I want to suggest to you there's one answer to the question as to how Jubilee Community Church is still here. And the answer is this. God has been carrying you all the way to this place. So I look back to 1984 and this little rabble of young people, they used to be young in those days, becoming part of this church and then you see that you've come through these, all these things and then you're still here. We can only come to one conclusion and the conclusion is this, that God has carried us throughout this journey from the beginning. He's still carrying us now and here's the important news. 
He will carry this church into the future, whatever happens. He is committed to us. This is a God who's unchanging. This is a God who is unaffected, actually, by anything that happens in this planet. This is a God who's sovereign and all-powerful, a God who's full of love. He's our heavenly Father who cares for us. He's a living God. And because He's a living God, it means He's a God who sustains us and provides for us and keeps us and holds us and never lets us go. Do you know that all through this last two and a half years, with all of its hassles and traumas and difficulties, this God has been working. And he says in his word, fear not, for I am with you. Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. This is the God who's carrying us on this journey together and it will never, ever change. It's amazing to know that you and I know a God who has promised to never, ever let us go, even when we let go of him. Do you know there's some amazing scriptures? Just let's look at some of them just to confirm this point. The God who carries us. Deuteronomy 1 verse 30. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt. Before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Isaiah 46, verse 3. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, let us who go. have bo been born by me before your birth, look at this, carried from the womb, even to your old age, God I am he. who carries, and to grey hairs I will carry you, I have made and I will bear and I will carry and I will save. So for someone with grey hair, this is great news. That even to the end of your age, from the womb, the promise of God is that he will carry you. Fantastic. Isaiah 63 verse 9 in all their affection, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Are you getting the picture? Psalm 28 verse 8. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage and be their shepherd and carry them forever. <laughs> One of the things that you find in the Old Testament particularly is God who is a living God speaks to the other gods who are not living gods but they are idols that people have made and he kind of mocks them. He kind of says, okay, <clears throat> you are my... And you, you are the ones who are vying for the attention of the people. Here I am, your God, your Father, your living God who will carry you. And here are all these little idols that you are making that you are putting your faith in. And if you look at Jeremiah chapter 10, it's, like, it's, just, it's a great little passage. Verse 3, it says in Jeremiah, For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of the craftsmen. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails and uh, that it cannot move. Other translation has, they fasten it so it does not totter. Their idols are like the scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried. For they cannot walk. <clears throat> do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. It's amazing. You don't get to carry God because he carries you. But when you make an idol, you have to carry it because it can't carry you. And you can make idols today of all sorts of things. You can make an idol of possessions. So you get possessions and it becomes your idol and what you end up doing is having to carry more and more of those idols. 
full-time Christian ministry for some people can become an idol. And when it becomes something so precious and an idol, you just have to end up carrying it rather than being carried by this living God. No one gets to carry God. Why? Because he carries you. Remember that strange passage in Scripture when a guy called Azar <coughs> goes down to catch the ark because it's falling and he gets killed. I don't want to get into the theology of that this morning because it's a bit complex. And I don't fully understand what was going on, but maybe this thing we're looking at gives you a hint. You don't get to carry me, says God. I don't need you. I don't need your help to assist me. Why? Because I am carrying and will continue to carry you. Is that okay? Are you following? This is really important. A couple more scriptures uh, just to, to confirm this in our hearts. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. A lot of you will know this scripture. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I love the fact that God's arms are not like mine. My arms are not everlasting. God's arms are Everlasting. It says in Psalm 90, God is from everlasting to everlasting. Jeremiah 31 says, you have been loved with an everlasting love. This, this carrying never runs out. <clears throat> this ability to hold us and sustain us never comes to an end because God is everlasting. It says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, <clears throat> he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Liz already told you that, you know, we have four children and I just can't remember how many grandchildren I've got, but there's a lot of them. And one of the things we'd love to do as a family was to walk. And one of the things we'd love to do is walk up hills. And when the children were small, we used to say, come on kids, we're going, this is where we're going, there's a tarn at the top of this hill, we're going to sit there and have a picnic and we need to get there. And so the children would kind of get going, and then when they were little and we'd get there, and you knew that at some point one of them was going to start complaining about having to get further up. Um, you know, and, and that doesn't stop, they, they whine and they complain, do I have to go, I don't want to go. And in the end, because of my amazing fathering skills, I will realise we're never going to get up there unless what? I start to carry this child. So I put the child on my shoulders and, and off we go and we start to make progress. But there comes a point when I get weary and tired of having to carry this child. And when I get to the age of 17, it really becomes very difficult indeed. <laughs> And so there comes this moment <clears throat> when I have to say to them, do you know what? I just can't carry you any further. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And I don't drop them. That would be not good news at the age of two and a half. I gradually will take them off my shoulders and say, come on, you're just going to have to go this distance together. I'm now a grandfather and I have grandchildren. I get about 10 yards before we have this conversation that it's time to get you off my shoulder because I've got older, so therefore I get more weary, so I get more tired having to carry these children. God never gets tired. He never gets weary. He will never drop you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. He is the everlasting God who never grows tired and never gets weary. So let me land this with three areas this morning for us today. Number one, and it's an obvious one, he carries you as an individual. And if you have a family, you can tuck that in in brackets. He carries you and he carries you as a family. If, he can, if you're a single person, he absolutely carries you as a single person. He's no discretion from those who ca he carries. And Philippians 1.6 says, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it through to completion. Jesus said, if a sparrow would fall to the ground, 
your heavenly Father knows. Now think about that. How many sparrows are there in South Africa? I mean, sparrows are sparrows, okay? I mean, they're not the most exciting bird in the world. You don't run out of your house and say, quick children, there's a sparrow in the garden. We hardly notice them. There's nothing about them that's particularly attractive. And so it's incidental, it's not incidental that Jesus says, even if a sparrow, incidental sparrow falls to the ground, how much more does your heavenly Father know you? And all the things you are going through in life right now, today. And so whatever life throws at us, let's be honest, it's throw, life's thrown quite a lot of things at us recently. Our heavenly Father knows every emotion, every feeling, every mental health issue, and he carries us through these things. And this brings two challenges to us this morning. The first is, will you let him carry you? You think, what a strange question. You've just been convincing us. Our father carries us. Of course he should carry me. But the reality is, some of us don't like being carried. Some of us like to carry ourselves. Some of us prefer independence. And we almost feel as if giving, having to have someone else come and help us is a weakness. And so actually, even in this room this morning, there are people who understand the theology that God carries us, but we just don't let him do it. It's too much of a risk. We like to be in control of everything. We don't want to let go. It's a faith issue to actually say, Father, would you carry me <coughs> through life? Because it means I'm no longer in control. I'm putting you in control instead of me. And you know, if you don't let him carry you, we self-impose all kinds of things and those things pile up in our lives and cause pressure until we all get exhausted. It's not easy for some of us to say, Lord, would you carry me? But the alternative is this. We end up carrying burdens we were never meant to carry. And it's like Jesus says, saying, would you please let me carry these things? Don't go on carrying things that you're not meant to carry. His shoulders are bigger than your shoulders. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. It says in Psalm 68, he will bear our burdens daily. Powerful words that we need to hear. 1 Peter 5. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him, hallelujah, because he cares for you. He carries you. He wants those burdens to be exchanged. Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. What's he saying? He's saying, come and give me your burdens. Let me carry you. And one of the features of the Holy Spirit is he's known as the helper. And the Greek word, you know these because you're a good, well-taught church. The Greek word is paraclete, and the word actually means one who comes alongside to carry the load. That's who the Holy Spirit is, who is dwelling in you if you are a believer. And so he is your helper. And my life, you know, you soon learn as a Christian, it's like a friend said to me after being four weeks of being saved and reading Scripture. He was an avid you know, reader, he, he devoured the Bible. And then he said to me one day, he said, you know, David, being a Christian is really hard. I don't know if I can keep up with all the things that Jesus says that I'm meant to do. It's really hard. I said to him, it's not hard at all. It's impossible. You need to learn that really quickly. You're not called to live the Christian life in your own strength. So you are given a helper called the Holy Spirit and if you and I learn daily to be filled with the Holy Spirit and depend on Him, He will be the one who will carry us through this life. Some of us this morning are carrying weights and the Holy Spirit is like over here in the corner saying, please, will you let, I am your helper. Why are you ignoring me? Why do you think you are gonna be able to do okay without me? Please let me carry. And you know, folks, I can't think of a single part of the Christian life 
where we don't need the help of the Holy Spirit. Try praying. I mean, praying without the Holy Spirit is really hard work. 10 minutes in and I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking, how long do I have to pray for? When I pray in the Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit, you know, the Apostle Paul is in the same camp. If you struggle with prayer this morning, you are not alone. Romans 8, Paul says, we don't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit helps us, carries the load. He helps us in our weakness and he teaches us how to pray. And an hour of praying in the Holy Spirit, you think, where on earth did that time go? It's a completely different world. You know, we worship this morning. Do you know there's a big difference between worshipping, uh, you know, just singing songs and actually worshipping? You can't worship without the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you will worship in spirit and in truth. It's a supernatural thing. So when I come to worship, <laughs> I'm very distracted by lots of... And in these strange worlds of masks, I mean, you have no idea how difficult it is for these guys to lead us in worship because they're enthusiastically worshipping and they have no idea what's going on in your life because you've got a mask that's stopping... It's hard work. <laughs> but I know that it's a work of the Spirit if I say, Holy Spirit, would you please come and help me to worship you today? Here's the Bible... Try understanding this without the Holy Spirit. He's been given to help you have revelation of what God is saying. Relating to Christians. You try that on your own? It's not a lot of fun. Have you noticed that Christians are weird? Have you noticed they're really strange? Have you noticed that everybody in the life group is not like you and you're looking at them? I've been in life groups and I've looked around and I've thought, Lord, everybody here is really weird. Without understanding, they're looking at me and they're thinking exactly the same thing. I can't love Christians without the Holy Spirit. And the Christian community is full of diversity, which means naturally speaking, we wouldn't hang out together. But guess what? We're one in Christ. Therefore, I don't get to choose who I hang out with in the body of Christ. Therefore, I need the help of the Holy Spirit. And if you hung out with me, I don't know, five minutes, you'd be saying, Holy Spirit, please help me to love this guy. Because we need the help of the Holy Spirit to do these things. When it comes to witnessing to our friends and neighbours and family, Jesus said, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, he will give you power to be a witness. Our dependency on the Holy Spirit as our helper is, is a huge issue. If you are married today, it takes five minutes to realise you need the Holy Spirit to help you with your marriage. And then when children come along, the desperation level rises. God, help me, Holy Spirit. I need... Some of you think this is really weird because you think Holy Spirit just happens in church. It doesn't. It happens in life. There's no secular spiritual divide. And when those children become teenagers, your desperation level goes up even more. And some of you are here as teenagers this morning and you're saying, and I need the Holy Spirit to cope with my parents. It's hard, it's hard raising kids and it's hard raising them when they become, te they become teenagers. I sometimes wonder what's more difficult, raising the dead or raising teenagers? It's kind of like, <laughs> not quite sure which one is more difficult. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to depend on Him. He's the one who's going to come and carry us through life. And COVID has given an opportunity for a lot of us to understand this. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. So that's the first challenge. It sounds strange, but will you let Him? I'd love to pray for some people this morning who are really honest and say, do you know what, I've been carrying this whole thing on my own. And this morning I realise I am in the hands of the God who carries me and I'm going to give this over to him and the radical difference in your life will be amazing. And there's a second little challenge and it's very quickly just mentioned this. And it's the question, are you building a safe kind of life? And you think, well, that, that, that's a bit of a strange question. But if you're building a life where you know everything, where everything is sorted and you, you have no needs because you're in control and you're doing everything, you will very rarely feel or even need the everlasting arms of your Father to be around you. You won't know that experience. And here's the challenge. When a tragedy hits or a mystery or a perplexity comes into your life, when things start to get difficult, you don't know what to do. 
And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying we're, we're irresponsible. I'm just saying as Christians, we need to live in the unknown. We need to live out of our comfort zones because this is safe and cautious and this is a little bit risky, but sometimes by faith, you only know the sense of God's care, care and caring when you get out of your comfort zone and when you're desperate because you're in need of Him. Does that make sense? I just think so many Christians, and, I do, and my observation about COVID is this, it's made us even more cautious. It's even made us more safe. And some of us get even more fearful. And it's just one of those things we have to learn to grapple with, but it comes as we begin to say, Lord, I, I want to know the everlasting arms. I can't go any further. I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to, take a, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. It's like the child at the top of the steps sees his father and says, I'm coming. <laughs> and they just jump they believe that you are going to catch them. I, it used to happen to me all the time. One day I thought, I'm just going to step back and just see what happens. No, not really. I'm only joking. But the reality is children do that because they know this is a moment. And we need to learn as Christians to not live in our comfort zones, but step out. He carries you. Number two, he carries this church. He carries the church globally. Therefore, he carries Jubilee Community Church. And you know, if you read your Bible, you realise that the church, the Bride of Christ, makes it. She's there at the end. How did she get there? Because the bridegroom carried her. Isn't that a wonderful picture? You know, there was a time in the past when there was a tradition that when you got married, that the bridegroom would lift up his bride and carry her across the threshold. I don't know if anyone ever does that anymore, but it used to happen. And it's a significant picture of Jesus and his church, his bride, that he picks us up, he carries us through this temporary world and on into eternity. You know, I live in Europe and where the stats are that the church will decline by water. Every time I hear these stats, I think, no, <laughs> these are not true. Why? Because it seems that the church will one day die, and yet we know, because we've read the, the end of the story, that we, the bride of Christ, will be taken and carried through to the end. He carries his church. In Ephesians chapter 1, Verse 22, it says this of Jesus, he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And in Colossians 1.18, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. You know, if Jesus stops carrying the church, it'll fall. If he stops building his church, then we will fail. If Jesus walks away from us, it all falls apart. Because these scriptures, and if you read other passages further in Colossians 1, it talks about this head of the church, the body, who holds the body together. It says all things are held together in him. All things were created by him. The phrase all things, all things, keeps coming all the time. This whole universe is held together in his hand. If for one moment he walks away, everything will fall apart. And Jubilee Community Church since the 1980s has come to where it is today for one simple reason, that this Jesus, who is the head of the body, has been feeding and growing and building and clothing and filling and adding and saving this church community. Notice he does it all. We don't get to do these things. He does it all. And so through the many years of being part of a local church, you begin to discover, oh, he has been carrying us. With all our ups and downs, he is the one who has been underneath our arms. The elders of this church don't get to carry this church. The deacons of this church don't get to carry this church. Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists don't get to carry the church. Your life group leaders don't get to carry, however gifted, 
<clears throat> However able all these people I've just mentioned are, they are not the ones who carry the church. Your faith is in Jesus, the head of the church. People come, people go. Leaders come, leaders go. Jesus remains the same yesterday, today and forever. What security is that? Some of us are thinking, well, I don't know about Jubilee community. I don't, church, there's been a lot of changes lately. There have been lots of ups and downs and difficulties. Can I really trust that over the next decade? Yes, you can. Because Jesus, who's carried you thus far, is and will continue to carry you into a wonderful, glorious future. Nine years ago, I handed over the local church that I was leading to James, who was, in his, who was then in his early 30s. Except I didn't. It wasn't mine to give. People talk about that. Which church do you go to? Some people, I go to Dave Holden's church. What a weird answer to that question. I'm just temporary. It says in Scripture, you know, Paul says, who's Apollos, who is Paul? It's God who gives the growth. You are God's building, not us. So we need to understand, it's so very important, particularly for what Jubilee has gone through in recent times. That James, who I handed over, he has to understand very quickly, I don't get to carry this. We are servants. We are shepherds. And our role is to point everybody to the one who is faithful and is carrying and is everlasting. This church has been carried for many years. The same one who's carried you thus far will carry you into the future. I want to encourage you, you can put your trust in him because he will give you everything that you need. It's a great future in this church. Isn't that wonderful? You know, some churches are very hot on vision and goals, and I'm not so hot on all that. So, I mean, I believe in it, but I just, I think just keep talking about Jesus. Just keep pointing to Jesus, because he's the one that's got us this far, <clears throat> and he's the one who'll get us into the future. Thirdly and finally, and I'll just mention this, because I would love to pray. He even carries this planet. He carries you as an individual. He knows all your needs. He carries this church because he's the one who's building it. He knows all about it. But he even gets to carry his planet. I already mentioned in Colossians 1 where it talks about all things are held together. Have you ever imagined that the God, Jesus is the one who created and therefore holds the whole universe together? The stars, the sun, the moon, the galaxies, the multitude of millions. I mean, the longer you live on this planet, the scientists will tell you even more extraordinary things. It just gets bigger. It just gets more complex. It just gets to a place where nobody holds this together. <laughs> it's a miracle. And you realise there's only one person, Jesus. And the head of the body, the church, is also the head of the universe. It says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within them, because he's the one who founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. If he walks away from the universe, if he walks away from planet Earth, the whole thing will collapse. Climate change is a big topic, isn't it? I presume it is here, it is where I live. Everyone's talking about climate change. And so much of it is really good, but we have to understand the Bible tells us there's a reason why this planet is groaning. It's what it says in Romans 8. And it's because it's dying and there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. This is kind of giving way to something even more glorious. And he holds and sustains us until that day when that happens. So God is not distant from this planet. In fact, he will be in control of this planet. And governments come and governments go. And empires come and empires go. And there are wars and rumours of wars and there's COVID pestilences and all sorts of things happening around. And the problem with humanity is we don't like not being in control. So we find this really difficult. A friend of mine in, in a church in the States, his child came home and said, you know that song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands? Well, our teachers just change it to, we've got the whole world in our hands. 
And you hear the phrase, don't you? Our planet. This is our planet. Oh, really? Did you make it? Are you sustaining it? We talk about our planet. And as Christians, we have a responsibility to steward this planet. It's not that we walk away from it. As a, a doctor who might know that a patient will eventually die, will do everything he can or she can in order to sustain life. That's the calling that we have. It's not that we just don't care. We do care, but we have to hold it lightly. Why? Because we don't get to carry this. Jesus, the head of the universe, is the one who is carrying this planet. I don't know about you, but I think the thought that humanity is not in control of this planet is good news rather than bad news. And the fact that we have a heavenly Father who knows everything and is in control is wonderful. Can we stand? Let's just pray. There may be people here this morning who are not Christians, they're just kind of looking in, just investigating, <laughs> wondering what it's like. Can I just say to you, if that's you today, there is a God in heaven who loves you. There is a God in heaven who wants you to know that he can be your father. There is right now a God in heaven who sees all the difficulties that you're facing and he wants to carry you through life. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Father, I pray for people here today who are on a journey to know you that even this morning they will get to a place of acknowledgement that they need you and that they don't want to carry life on their shoulders any longer. Please talk to somebody today that they might introduce you to this wonderful Jesus who can save you and give you new life. And Father, I want to pray for Christians here this morning. I want those who are struggling to let you carry them to give that over to you this morning. I want to pray for people here who've got certain areas of their life that are overwhelming and all-consuming. You wake up in the morning thinking about things. You think about them at night. It interrupts your sleep. It's the last thing you think about when you put your head on your pillow at night. It's all-consuming. There are people here like that, and I, there's an invitation here this morning to not stay in that position but by faith to believe there is a God who carries you. Holy Spirit, will you come to people across this congregation this morning who are under things, burdens, and help them to give them to the one who carries them, who is even now saying, please let me carry these things for you. You know, those problems, they don't disappear they just completely feel different. That child who is carried by the father walking up, it feels completely different, sustained. And the effort's all gone. Holy Spirit, would you come to people here today? And if there are people whose lives have become too safe, too predictable, don't need you, I pray you'll give us the courage to get out of the comfort zone and find you there. And above all, Lord, today, I want to pray for this church, <laughs> Jubilee Community Church. I thank you for the past. I thank you for where we are now. And I thank you for the wonderful future that we have. And that the same God who has started this community and has carried it through to this present day will surely be the one who will carry it into the future. And I pray for a rise this morning of faith. Not in man, not in woman, not in systems, not in organisation, not in multiple gifts, but in the only one who carries us. I pray for confidence to be restored this morning for people who have lost it. Because it's not about us and our ideas and systems. It's confidence that comes by looking to you, Jesus, and reading in your word of what you say about your church. 
and that we don't get to dwell on the past and even the now, but we begin by faith to walk towards the future. Raise up a new generation of people, a post-COVID generation that's not to do with age folks, it's just to do with those who are here, the multi-faceted, diverse community. Raise this generation who will live without fear and will be able to totally commit themselves to you and all that you have promised to do in this church community. We ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen. I have no idea how this church prays for people. I presume they do. If uh, there's anything I've said this morning that you feel, I need someone to pray for me. I don't want to leave this building without being prayer. I've been prayed for. Carl will tell you how that works. Thank you.